Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, number of substrings with only ones. And I'm gonna do you a nice little favor today and basically solve this problem for you in about 30 seconds. Let me just show you the entire intuition of the problem. So I guess let me spend like 10 seconds on what they're actually asking. We're given a binary string. Keep in mind it's a string, they're not actual digits. And we wanna know the number of substrings that contain all ones. Brute force would just be look at a one and then count every single substring starting from there. So we would look at the zero, but obviously we'd skip that. We'd look at the one, okay, we got one, we get two. This is a zero, so we can't continue. Uh, we would then start here. And I mean, that's just one. It's a different substring than the ones that we counted before, and then we can't really extend it any further. And so you could go like that. Brute force is O of N squared, but you kind of probably see where I'm going with this. The trick here is imagine you have three contiguous ones. Can we somehow, not just as we're counting the substring starting from here, which would be one, two, three, can we somehow also at the same time count all the other substrings? For example, the one starting here and here and the one over here. And the answer is yes, the trick is this. It's very, very logically simple. So right now we're here. We just have a single one, that's one substring. Okay, now when we introduce a second one, what we're saying is, well, with this one, we have one substring ending here, but we had one previous one. So with that, we have a second substring ending here. We're thinking about it in terms of like the substrings ending at the one. Okay, so we got a one, and then with this guy, we got a plus two, and then with this guy, we're going to get a plus three. And logically, it's very, very simple. We introduce a one here, so that's one substring. We had two previous ones, so that means there's two substrings ending here that include those ones, and so that just added three substrings. So basically, the number of continuous ones we have determines how many substrings we have ending at this particular number. So if we introduce another one, that's gonna give us four more substrings. If we introduce another one, that's gonna give us five more substrings. That's it. So once you know that, you can code the problem up in multiple different ways. I'll show you at least two different ways to do it. But so this is how we're gonna do. We're gonna have a pointer. We see a zero, we just skip it. Who cares about the zero? Okay, we see a one. Then we wanna know how many ones we continuously have. So let me just say, I have some variable called consecutive. Probably could have chosen a shorter word than that. But so we see this one. Okay, we have one consecutive one. And then we're gonna take whatever the consecutive is and we're gonna add it to the result. So we get one, great. Okay, now the pointer is gonna be here. It's a second one. So what we're gonna do is increment consecutive. Now consecutive is gonna be two, uh, very poorly drawn, but then we're gonna take the two and add it to the result. Now the pointer is here, it's zero. What do we do? We should probably set this back down to zero. And I guess you could now add it to the result. It's not gonna do anything, or you could just not add it, depending on how you code up your if statements. Next, we go here, it's a one, we set this back to one, we plus one there. This is gonna make this a two, plus two there. This is gonna make it a three and then plus three there. So that's gonna be six plus three. That's nine different substrings. That is the correct result. You can see the way I reasoned about this. We're only really uh, visiting each position once. That's linear time, no extra data structures. That's constant space. Let's code it up. So let's just reset this. And one thing I didn't mention in this problem is that our result could grow very big. So they actually want us to mod it by this big prime number if it gets bigger than that. So let's just declare that variable up there and let me have my consecutive count, which is gonna be zero. And then we're just iterating over every character in the input if the character is equal equal to one, whoops, I'm going a little too fast for myself. We're gonna do something, and if it's not one, we're gonna do something different. If it's one, we're just gonna increment the consecutive count, and then we're gonna increment the result by that consecutive count, and otherwise, we're just gonna reset the consecutive count to zero. And then after that, we can return the result, but like I said, it could get too big. So in Python, at least, you can put the mod over here, because Python can actually store arbitrarily large numbers. You don't have to worry about this overflowing, uh, but in most languages, you're gonna have to put it over here, because the constraint is, uh, the consecutive is never going to be bigger than the mod. We don't really have to mod that, but the result plus that could get bigger. So let's mod that. And then out here, we don't really need this anymore. And then I'll run this. 
and you can see it works. It's pretty efficient. The other way uh, is going to be less clean, but logically it might make more sense for people. So it's more of like rather than having this if statement, we just keep uh, extending the pointer until we reach the end of that one segment. So then we wouldn't even need this consecutive count. So we could do something like this where we have pointers and we do while i is in bounds and then rather than making this an if statement we can make it a loop and you can do while s of and we're actually going to need a second pointer here so we can keep track of the length of the segment so rather than having a consecutive count we're just using pointers j will initially start at i while this is the case and also while j is in bounds we're going to rather than increment the consecutive count we are going to increment the J pointer, but before we increment the J pointer, because after we increment it, there's no guarantee it's still pointing at a one. But before we increment it, what we're going to do is add to the result this uh, result plus that and basically the size of the window, the number of consecutive ones we have, which is the same as the variable that we had before. So uh, J minus I plus one is the size of the window. Add that to result, mod it by this and then increment that. Now we also, like there's no guarantee this is gonna execute. So down here, we would definitely want to increment i by one at least, but we also don't know if this did execute. If it did, then we want i to be past j. So what we can do is set this, i is gonna be j plus one out here. So in the worst case, like if this loop executes, j will stop at a zero. So if we increment past that, it's okay. And if this loop never executes, well, this will just be i incremented by one. So it works out in both cases. I think this code is correct. Let's just give it a run. And yeah, you can see it works. And I think like overall time complexity is the same. I think it just made like a few milliseconds of a difference. But if you found this helpful, check out Neat Code IO for a lot more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys soon.